Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I just want to say, you know, even more of a special thank you for, for signing up for this training and being interested in this, um, volunteering for this program, um, because of all of the programs that, you know, we do at SAC Tree. This is one of the ones that we're fortunate enough to be able to pretty much do in its full capacity right now, given all the circumstances. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, it's a, it's a really kind of unique and special citizen science program that Sacramento has. And so you're going to learn a lot. It's going to seem like a lot, um, but it, it's, it's a really cool opportunity to be a part of. And um, I'm just glad you're here. Um, so I hope you're all here today because you're interested in learning about some of our biggest, oldest, and most beautiful trees and what you can do to help save them. We'll get a chance to talk um, about the science in a little bit, but we also want to make sure that you understand the history and the context of this issue. Um, so hopefully you'll walk away from this training with an expanded appreciation of our urban forest and how much um, care it takes the entire community to keep it healthy. Um, if you're only interested in the scientific aspects of this program, we respect that and we'll get to it shortly. Just know that the biggest takeaway from today's presentation and the biggest way that you can help save the elms is to learn how to spot Dutch elm disease and distinguish between DED and other issues that resemble it. Um, but for now, let's jump into why these trees are super special. Uh, once a population of about 25,000, now we only have 1,880 public elms remaining in Sacramento. Um, we primarily have English and American elms in Sacramento, but there's a significant number of Siberian and Chinese elms in the city as well, um, and some Zelkovas, which are in the elm family. Um, the Chinese and Zelkovas are more resistant to Dutch elm disease, so they're not really a part of this program. Um, Alex will go into that a little bit later. Um, but about 40 elms a year are removed because of old age, structural problems, um, development, or Dutch elm disease. Last year we had about 24 public elms removed for Dutch elm disease and a few more um, for structural or age related safety issues. Um, new DED resistant varieties of elms like the Zelkova I mentioned are beautiful and do really well in our region but they'll never reach the size of older elms. These older elms were planted back when our streets were much smaller and we didn't have so many sidewalks and buildings encroaching on planter space. And when a mature elm is removed today, we will lose the canopy coverage of a larger tree forever. Knowing what we know now about siding trees, most of the sites where we are removing elms will be replanted with small and medium trees um, that will not even come close to providing the benefits of a larger tree. Some of these sites will not even be able to be replanted at all due to encroachment from infrastructure like 5G um, and fiber optic cable. So it's essential that we preserve the standing mature canopy for as long as we possibly can. Um, if you're here watching this presentation as a tree lover, I'm assuming. Um, so I'm sure that you know about the benefits of trees, but just to reiterate, um, a robust urban canopy can provide a myriad of benefits to our communities, such as shade for streets and buildings, which result in energy savings, um, improved air quality, stormwater filtering and retention, increased retail activity, slower traffic, less crime, better public health, ample wildlife habitat, higher property values, a more beautiful neighborhood, and a huge sense of community. We're gonna go into a little bit of a history of our elms pretty soon here. On the East Coast where American elms are native and English elms were planted in mass, um, it's well known how the story of elms ends. Dutch elm disease wiped almost all of them out. Um, but here's the beginning of the story. Recognizing the need for shade in the um, early 1800s when Sacramento was founded, um, Sacramento uh, founders planted elms widely um, and in mass because they reminded them of their hometowns back east. Um, these planted elms created what was essentially a monoculture. This part of our history serves as a reminder of the need for biodiversity. When large numbers of the elms died and we lost that canopy coverage, it had a super negative effect on our ecology and quality of life. As humans, we learn um, lessons the hard way. We've gone through the same type of issue with other tree fads, such as eucalyptus planted in the 1800s to clean the air and prevent disease. Those turned out to be a fire hazard and unsafe around structures. 
Um, in Sacramento, we have a lot of Modesto ash that are um, that line mid-century suburbs, and now they're all reaching the end of their lifespans and becoming hazardous, leaving a lot of neighborhoods with no trees at all. Um, fruitless mulberries were found to be very disruptive to hardscape, so many have been removed for that reason. The moral of the story is plant the right tree in the right spot and plant many different species within a community. So here's a brief visual timeline of our elm history here in Sacramento. Um, in 1870, we started planting elms as street trees in many Sacramento neighborhoods. In 1921, Dutch elm disease um, had spread to Europe. Um, it originated in Asia and um, it was isolated and named by scientists in the Netherlands. Make sure everything's working. Okay. Um, Dutch elm disease arrived in North America in the later 1920s and early 1930s on a shipment of lumber, they suspect, um, that came from the Netherlands that was intended to go to Ohio. Um, There's a booming furniture industry in Ohio at that time. And by the 1970s, it wiped out a huge population of elms in the east and had begun spreading to the west. Um, it's estimated that over 75% of nearly 77 million um, elms in North America were dead by 1990. So the first confirmed case of Dutch elm disease in Sacramento popped up in 1990 at 10th and G Streets downtown. Um, knowing what happened on the East Coast and what this meant for our elm population, CAL FIRE started a DED monitoring program in 1991, but only had funding to run the program itself until 1993. At which point, CAL FIRE realized they needed some help, and in 1994, the Sacramento Tree Foundation um, took over the elm monitoring program and created the first iteration of this program, the Save the Elms program, which ran successfully as a citizen science initiative until 2005. Um, during those 10 years, uh, volunteers identified 442 cases of Dutch elm disease. For funding and support reasons, the STEP program went dark after 2005 and the monitoring of our elms became a daunting task for the City of Sacramento urban forestry team. Um, but in 2016, a partnership was born of the two and the STEP program was revived and to be run by SAC Tree, powered by volunteers and supported by the City of Sacramento. Um, this is a photo of an elm lime street in Illinois. Um, like I said, the, the largest population of elms was in the east um, before it was wiped out. Um, and it serves as a visual reminder of what we stand to lose. Um, these elms can never be replaced. This is that same street um, after DED had taken its toll in Illinois and wiped out all of those elm trees. So you'll see it total exposure to the sky, um, all of that shade that was provided by that elm canopy is gone. Um, to draw a comparison between that example and what we stand to lose here in Sacramento, here's a photo of McClatchy Park in Oak Park, um, just south of the grid. As of last year, there were about 60 elms making up almost all of this park's canopy. With two confirmed cases of DED removed in July last year, uh, it's more than likely going to become a hotspot in the coming years. Even though we've already lost many of our elms, we still have a lot left to lose. Some communities will be hit harder than others. McClatchy Park is an important gathering spot for Oak Park residents and the site of many community events. What will happen when there's no shade at this park? Will people even still come here? Will events still happen? Will there continue to be opportunities for connection and social cohesion? This is a really central park for that community. Um, here's a map showing the locations of our elms. This is from back in 2018. Um, so besides Oak Park, other neighborhoods with large populations of elms include Land Park, um, Downtown and Midtown, Curtis Park, Elmhurst, East Sacramento, North Sacramento, and the Del Paso Heights area. Last year, we had 24 trees removed because of Dutch elm disease. Um, nine of those cases were in Land Park alone. So Land Park is a huge hotspot for us um, going into this year. Additional cases of Dutch elm disease were found in the Old City Cemetery off of Broadway, um, Curtis Park, McClatchy Park, McKinley Park, and the Marshall School, 
which is technically not city property, but it's near um, a huge concentration of elms in Midtown. Um, and then Grant Park and Southside uh, Park neighborhoods as well. Um, these are spots that warrant heavier monitoring coverage, especially early in the season, like May and June. Um, the trees that were infected last year might not have shown symptoms at the end of the season, but with spring bringing on all that new growth and new leaves, the tree's vascular systems are pushing tons of water and nutrients upward towards its leaves. Um, so they may start to show symptoms really early and the disease can move super quickly from there. Even um, then, these spots deserve a little extra attention during monitoring season um, because they are extra vulnerable. Alex is going to get into the specifics of the disease really, really soon, um, but it's important to note just how quickly Dutch elm disease can kill a tree and why regular monitoring and early detection are crucial in the fight against its spread. Um, this was the tree that was inbound of the Marshall School property in Midtown, and it was detected as symptomatic by one of our volunteers just last year. Um, in this case, because the tree belonged to and was under the jurisdiction of the Sac City Unified School District, the tree sat after having been identified as infected for almost a month, well, for over a month. Um, a city tree wouldn't be allowed to sit for that long. They would take action much quicker. Um, but this was an unfortunate case because of the threat that this tree posed to the nearby city elms. Um, and this photo gives us an opportunity to document um, the quick and super drastic decline of a tree with Dutch elm disease. I just want to give a big shout out to our volunteer Chris Smith, who's on this call right now, and his wife Julia for identifying this tree um, and even contacting Sac City Unified um, directly to demand that this tree get removed from their neighborhood. Great job, guys. Um, I'd also like to give a huge shout out to our awesome sponsors and partners at the City of Sacramento Department of Public Works, which is the department that urban forestry is under. Um, the city sponsors this program because it recognizes that they alone can't prevent this loss of our elms um, and that everyday people, um, the eyes on the ground, um, like yourselves, are critical in slowing the spread of Dutch elm disease. These are the people behind the scenes of the program, um, the ones taking action after we've reported to them. Uh, normally, you'd be able to meet them at one of our mid-season check-ins or at our end-of-season celebration, um, but those, of course, in-person meetups are kind of to be determined given the circumstances today. Um, we may be able to set up some virtual meetups so um, you can pick their brains, but we'll get back to you on that, whether we can make that happen or not. So we've done a history and we've talked about why elms are the best and we've reached the point where we're going to get into the science part of it all. Um, but before we do, I just want to briefly explain the step process as a whole. You guys come in, um, you take this training, you become elm experts who will take all your newfound knowledge and love out into the streets of Sacramento to safely monitor our, guide, our elms following social distancing guidelines. Um, you will use our mobile app, which we'll cover later, to report trees um, that you believe are showing symptoms of Dutch elm disease. We'll review those reports and those photos that you submit. We'll report um, symptomatic looking trees to the city who will go out there and inspect them and take samples of the trees if necessary to confirm. And then if a tree is confirmed to be infected, it will be removed by the city. And Alex will cover a little bit more about why that is. Um, hopefully, most likely, the wood will be recycled through our Urban Wood Rescue Program, which if you didn't know about, um, Sac Tree has an Urban Wood Rescue Program that saves usable trees from Sacramento um, and mills it into lumber to be sold and used by local craftsmen and makers. So that wood doesn't go to waste and those trees get to live on another day in another form. Um, I just have a few pictures to share from a last season and a couple seasons ago. Um, here's a photo from our check-in at Land Park in 2019. Um, we had our largest number of confirmed Dutch elm cases there last year. This um, in the safety vest is Kevin McLean. He's our resident elm expert and street tree guy. Um, and he's pointing out the symptomatic area of an infected tree to our volunteers here. Um, this is a photo of myself, hello, uh, showing one of our volunteers how to report a symptomatic tree on our app. 
Here's a photo of Kevin McLean taking a sample of the inner wood after girdling the bark of an infected tree in a land park in 2018, so the year before. Um, Alex will explain that process a little bit more, um, but you can see a good example of fungal staining on the inner wood indicating the presence of Dutch elm disease. Here is an elm being removed um, from the street near the Sophia Center for the Arts, the new B Street Theater. Um, in 2018. This tree didn't show signs of Dutch elm disease, but it declined really quickly after construction of that building, um, had damaged its roots, and it was deemed a safety hazard and was removed. Here's an elm being delivered to our Urbanwood Rescue Lumberyard to be milled, dried, and sold. All the proceeds from the sales made at Urbanwood go right back to the Tree Foundation, which is pretty cool. Um, it helps us to fund all of our programs and keeps us doing the work that we're doing. And finally, here's some milled um, elm slabs that have been debarked to prevent transportation of elm bark beetles before being slabbed. Um, you can see on some places, like if you can see my cursor right here, these are the egg galleries that the bark beetles um, lay inside the tree. And, and Alex will go over that in our little science portion. But yeah, anywhere you're, you see like a weird squiggly, those are actually bark beetle egg galleries on elm slabs. All right, and with that, I'm gonna take a little break and Alex is going to take over. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about elm identification. Um, Sacramento has about 1900 elms that we monitor through this program. Uh, and that includes the American, English, and Siberian elms. Uh, we also have a lot of Chinese elms and Zelkovas, which are closely related. Uh, but those species are far less susceptible to Dutch elm disease, so we don't monitor them currently. So, uh, general traits of elms, um, ragged edges to the leaves. The leaves have an uneven base, which means if you look at this side here, um, it comes further down the stalk or petiole than the other side does. That's one of the most important identifying characteristics. Uh, it also has rough fissured bark and an umbrella-like form with a vase-like branching habit. Um, in general, don't worry too much about learning how to identify the individual types of elms. We're just going to go over this, you know, sort of for your general information, um, but it can be helpful if uh, you're looking at the app and you see you know, it'll show you where the tree is marked on the map, but there may be multiple trees nearby and you may need to be able to tell which is an elm and which is not an elm. So, um, let's talk about the American elm. Uh, it has large, doubly serrated leaves. So, what that means is if you go around the edge here, you can see that there are these larger teeth and then kind of cut into those larger teeth are another set of smaller teeth. So, that's what doubly serrated means. Um, they also do not have any hair on them. So that's gonna be really important for distinguishing them from the English elm, which has kind of a fuzzy feel to it. Um, the ridges on the bark are kind of woven looking. Uh, we often say it looks like a basket weave uh, or a braided appearance. And um, it's kind of a brownish color uh, in general. Uh, they have that classic vase shaped form and they're usually about as tall as they are wide, anywhere from about 40 to 80 feet. So pretty good sized tree. The English elm um, also has those same serrated edges to the leaves, um, but in contrast to the American elm, the leaves are kind of hairy or fuzzy to the touch. Uh, the bark is light gray, fissured and furrowed, um, and it also tends to have the ridges in it, um, which as you can see are not quite as prominent, but they are very vertical. They don't have the same meandering characteristic as the American elm. Uh, it's also often one of the tallest trees on the skyline. Um, in fact, maybe the tallest broadleaf tree in the city. Um, sometimes can get over 100 feet tall. So that can, that can be a helpful uh, identifying characteristic as well. Um, finally, we have the Siberian elm. Also has those serrated leaves, but in contrast, these are going to be only singly serrated. So we only have one set of teeth here along the margin. Um, the bark is a light gray brown and it's furrowed. Uh, usually grows to about 60 feet tall, so a little bit smaller than the other two species. 
Um, the Siberian elm is a lot less susceptible to Dutch elm disease. Um, so we have not monitored it in the past, but because there's not that many of them and they can still get the disease, we decided to add them to the program. Um, one thing to note is that these trees are the favorite food of a lot of squirrels. So oftentimes you'll see a lot of squirrel damage on these trees. Um, and that's something to be aware of because squirrel damage can look very similar to Dutch elm disease. So let's talk about the disease in a little bit more detail here. Um, most of you guys probably know a little bit about this, but uh, Dutch elm disease is a fungal disease that basically prevents the tree from being able to transport water from its roots to the top, um, and therefore it kills the tree by depriving it of water. Um, it has two main methods of spread through root grafts, which are where the root system of two neighboring trees has fused, um, and by being carried by the elm bark beetle. So this is gonna be the really important part of this talk, um, the symptoms of Dutch elm disease. This is what you need to know in order to be able to identify uh, the disease out in the field when you're looking for it. The most important symptom that we're gonna be looking for is wilting and flagging. Um, what that means is that the leaves will droop and curl with a distinctive droop in the petiole. Um, the leaves will generally start out kind of a pale green as they wilt, then they'll turn to yellow and then brown. Um, the disease moves quickly, so oftentimes you'll see, you know, maybe one branch starts out wilting and then it rapidly moves down the tree into lower branches, uh, progressing very quickly, especially in heat waves. Um, also, as I said, because the tree, the disease infects the vasculature of the tree, it moves up and down the tree because that's where the, the, the tree is transporting water. Um, so oftentimes you'll see it only on one side or if you watch it spread, it'll be going you know, up or down along the tree. Uh, it also tends to affect the epicormic shoots. Um, they will wilt and die along with the rest of the tree. Uh, epicormic shoots are small little sprouts that usually come from the base of the tree or an area where the tree has been injured. And this is important because most other stressors of the trees are not going to affect the epicormic sprouts. Epicormic sprouts are kind of like an insurance policy for the tree. They sprout when the tree is not sure whether the main trunk is going to survive. In case it dies, then they can grow and take over and grow a new tree. Um, so typically, they will be the very last thing to suffer and die when a tree is in decline from other causes. Um, also, because they're so small, often less than a quarter inch thick, the squirrels won't usually bother to feed on them. Um, so there are other symptoms of Dutch elm disease as well. We're not really going to be looking for these, but this is what the city arborists use in order to identify the disease. Um, so on the wood, just under the bark, there will be dark streaks. That's where the fungus is growing through those veins in the wood where, where uh, the water should be. Um, you'll also see egg galleries under the bark, which is where the larvae have chewed little tunnels into the wood. Um, you can also see shot holes, um, basically a little hole in the tree um, where the, the beetle bores its way out and flies away when it's done feeding as a larva. Um, and in some cases, you can also see bark beetles themselves just crawling around and flying around the tree. So here we have a picture of the classic DED wilt. Um, you can see that the leaves are kind of a white or light yellow color. Um, they've curled and uh, you know, it's, it's localized in one area. This is obviously very early in the infection, um, but those are the main things to look out for, that curl and that color. Here's another image. This one's progressed a little bit further, so the leaves have started to turn brown, but notice that they're more of a yellowish brown. Um, other, other causes of uh, damage or decline in the trees will often lead to a more of a reddish brown leaf color. Um, especially once they've aged enough. Okay, so here we have a few pictures of confirmed cases of DED. Um, the middle one I really like because it shows the full progression of the tree. You can see it started up here. The disease has been there for a while. This area is completely dead. As you go down, you start to see some of those brown leaves where the disease has been for a little while. And then further out on these branches and lower down, you can see the more yellowy colored leaves where uh, the disease has recently spread to. So 
let's go in depth a little bit more on those uh, methods of spread. Now, when you're out in the field and, and looking for Dutch elm disease, you don't really need to be able to identify how the disease spread. Um, this is just for background information so you can kind of understand what's going on. But uh, don't worry about trying to distinguish these out there. The end result is gonna be the same. The tree, unfortunately, is going to die and we're gonna to have to remove it to prevent it from infecting other trees. Um, so root grafts, this is thought to be the most common uh, method of spread in Sacramento. Uh, basically, like I said before, if two large trees are growing near each other for long enough, their roots will actually fuse together. Um, normally that's beneficial because it allows them to share resources and kind of support each other. Um, but it also lets the disease kind of hijack that system and spread from tree to tree. Um, so typically when this is the case, you'll see the disease start lower down on the trunk and spread up one side of the tree before coming back down, infecting the rest of the tree and going systemic. Um, some, in some cases, uh, you can trench the roots to separate those root grafts and keep neighboring trees from being infected. But uh, it's not always advisable because severing the roots of large trees can make them more likely to fall over. And a lot of these trees are in public spaces. They're very large and so they could be dangerous if they fall over. Um, so instead of that, often what we'll do is as soon as the disease has been identified, uh, the city will come in and strip uh, a layer of bark um, around all the way around the trunk and since all of the living tissue in the tree is on the outer edge there, um, that actually fully separates the, the canopy from the root system and prevents the disease from spreading. If it's only in the canopy, it can't get to the roots where it's gonna spread and be able to infect other trees. Um, I know it's kind of sad that we're killing the tree here, but the reality is it was gonna die anyway. And this way we can save other trees from the same fate. So the other main method of spread is the elm bark beetle. Um, the beetle feeds on the limbs, and so that's often where you'll see the infection start. Uh, the beetle itself doesn't actually carry, or it doesn't actually cause the disease directly. It just gets the fungus on its body, and when it burrows into the bark of a new tree, if it's carrying that, the fungus will infect that tree as well. Um, so there are uh, two generations every year, plus another one that overwinters. Um, and like I said, when you, when you see this vector at play, uh, oftentimes the disease will start in one or a few branches at the very top of the tree. It'll spread down that one side, get the roots, go systemic, and then infect the rest of the tree and kill it. Um, so this is usually how the disease spreads longer distances because these little guys can fly from tree to tree. Here's one that crawled out when we were milling some elm lumber at our urban wood rescue yard. I actually think the beetles are kind of cute even though they cause a lot of devastation. So here are those egg galleries I was talking about before. So if you look at here, you can see that the beetle lays its eggs right here. Each one of those eggs hatches into a little larva which chews its way over here. And then once it's had enough to eat, it will emerge from the bark and go on to continue its life cycle. So let's talk about some other possible causes of wilting. Um, you may look at this picture and say, look, there it is. There's the Dutch elm disease. You know, it's, we got the classic symptoms. We've got wilting leaves that are curled. They're kind of this pale color. Um, it's localized on one branch. Um, but if you look closely here, you'll notice something interesting, which is that the bark has actually been stripped away. Um, and that is going to be squirrel damage. Um, so, this is one of the most common issues uh, that we see with this program is that squirrel damage and other problems with the tree are far more common than Dutch elm diseases. So we get a lot of people submitting pictures of trees that are you know, relatively healthy um, or at least not infected. Um, and we're hoping that we can educate you guys on some of the ways that we just try to distinguish these issues from Dutch elm disease. Um, so if there's one thing that you take away from this talk, it's how to identify Dutch elm disease and how to identify some of these other issues so that you know not to submit these. Um, so with squirrel damage, you typically see it on uh, kind of mid-sized branches. They're not gonna bother with anything really small and they usually 
will not do enough damage to completely girdle a larger branch. So you can see basically the bark's just been chewed off all the way around, kills this branch just like the girdling that we just talked about. Um, so typically once the leaves are a little bit older and more fully dead than these ones are, uh, they'll turn more of a reddish brown color compared to the more uh, yellow brown of the Dutch elm disease. Um, so be aware of that. Also, you know, always when you see a wilting branch, try to walk around, get a look at it from a different angle. See if you can spot that point of attachment and see if you can um, notice that the bark has been chewed off. Typically, it's pretty visible early on, but it will oxidize and turn darker or even black, which can make it hard to spot later on. So definitely worth taking a, a careful look around the tree to see if you can see that. Also very similar to this, if the branch is just broken, it can look similar in some cases as well. You won't see the chewed bark, but you can see where it snapped off, or you can often tell because the branch will be hanging down at a much different angle than the rest of the canopy. Um, again, uh, Siberian elms tend to have a lot more of this than the other species. So that's another thing to be aware of. If you're looking at a Siberian elm, you definitely need to be extra careful to uh, make sure that it's not squirrel damaged before you report it. And so here's this uh, chewed location I was talking about. So another problem that people commonly spot is uh, this issue with the little holes on the leaf here. This is actually caused by the elm leaf beetle, which is a different type of beetle. It does feed on the leaves, but because it doesn't feed on the bark, it does not carry Dutch elm disease. And um, it is harmful to the tree, but it's usually not fatal. Um, so basically, they chew these holes in the leaves. Sometimes after they've been chewed up like this, they'll, they'll turn brown. Um, but typically, the leaves will not curl, and they'll have these very visible holes. So that's how you can distinguish this from Dutch elm. If you do see a heavy infestation, feel free to uh, call uh, 311, and they can uh, treat the tree for this. But in general, it's a lot less serious of a problem than Dutch elm disease. Here's a few more pictures of how it can look. So drought stress and dieback. This is another big one that's common in our area. We live in a dry climate. Um, and so oftentimes these trees may have had branches that have died you know, recently or in past years, but are still hanging on there. Um, and this can sometimes look similar to Dutch elm as well. Typically with drought stress, you're gonna see wilting leaves throughout the whole canopy, not just localized on one branch or on one side. Um, and You'll also see that sort of the outer edges will die first. And, you know, especially if the tree has recovered from that drought stress, like this one kind of looks like it has, um, you'll see lush, green, healthy growth closer into the core um, surrounded by these dead branches. Um, and that's because, you know, the further up you get into that canopy, the harder it is for the tree to haul all that water up there. So if it's a little bit stressed, it's going to let those go first so that it can regrow later on. Um, so this one can be hard to identify because there's not always you know, uh, sort of the proof like we saw with the squirrel damage where we can see the chewed bark. So look at the surroundings, see if you can spot uh, drought tolerant landscapes. If it looks like there's no water at all anywhere, you know, under or near the canopy, that could be a clue that the tree may be suffering from drought stress. Um, also, if you see, you know, one that's really advanced like this, where, you know, a large limb or a significant portion of the canopy has died, definitely feel free to report that to 311. That can be a hazard, and these limbs are also the favored breeding habitat for the elm bark beetle. So we wanna kind of reduce those as much as we can. Um, but again, not Dutch elm. We're not gonna report this through Curio. Um, it's a separate issue. So we also often see dieback due to construction damage. Um, this is gonna look a little bit different, but overall fairly similar to the drought stress. It's usually caused by damage to the root system. Um, and what happens is, you know, they are digging and they've exposed the roots to air that lets them dry out or sometimes the roots will be severed to make room for, you know, an underground utility or concrete. Um, the roots could be compacted due to vehicles driving over them or piling dirt on top of them. Um, so all kinds of things can happen, but what happens, generally the way it looks is, you know, the roots will get damaged and then the tree cannot supply enough water to its canopy. So again, same kind of uh, manifestation, the outer edges and the top of the tree will usually be more severely affected than the trunk and the core branches, which you can see quite nicely on this one. Looks like it started to recover by putting out a lot of new growth from these bigger branches. 
Um, so unfortunately, you know, this is all too common in our area. There are rules in place to try to prevent it, but there's not always enough capacity to enforce that. So we also have power lines. Um, this one's not as common of a cause of damage, but it, if the branches grow too close, they can spark and get burned. Um, also important to note, power lines are little squirrel highways. And so oftentimes you'll see increased squirrel damage um, on a tree that's growing next to uh, power lines. So something to watch for. It doesn't mean that a tree that's under power lines can't get DED, but it's just something to, to double check when you see a tree like this. So to sum it all up, we have a lot of things that we need to check for whenever we see a potential, what we think might be a potential case of DED. We wanna check for chewed bark that could indicate squirrel damage. We wanna check for broken branches. We wanna check for holes in the leaves that could indicate the elm bark beetle. We wanna look for no leaves, which could suggest you know, an older dieback. Um, and if the, especially if the leaves next to that dieback look healthy, it's probably not DED because that spreads rapidly and will kill the whole tree before those leaves would fall off. Um, also look for low water surroundings that could indicate drought stress, power lines, recent construction, or even a recent heat wave. Um, so again, none of these things necessarily rule out uh, DED, but you know, if you only see these things and you don't see those characteristic signs of DED, then that's for where you have to use your judgment and say, ah, oh, this is probably not it. I'm not going to submit it. Um, you know, if you're not sure, feel free to submit it. But uh, overall, we're trying to get people to more have that level of knowledge where they can make that assessment themselves. So with that in mind, let's do a little pop quiz here. Um, I'm going to show you some slides. Each slide is one tree that was submitted to us. Uh, sometimes like this one, there'll be multiple pictures of the same tree. This is the top and this is lower down. Um, but think of all those things I just went over. Look for the signs of DED. Look for the signs of other issues and see if you think that these trees are affected by the disease or whether they're affected by something else. So take a close look at all, all over the branches. Sometimes it's obvious what's you know, the area in question, and sometimes it's not. Here's another one. This is a close-up of the top here. Here we've got this guy. This really nice close-up here tells us a lot since we can see a lot of detail. top of this tree here. And then there's this one. Okay, so what, what do you guys think? Um, if you guessed that none of these trees have Dutch elm disease, you are actually correct. So um, I think the one that trips people up the most is probably the one, this one here. We've got these kind of pale colored leaves. They're nice and curled. Um, it's localized in one area. So, you know, we, we could expect maybe it hasn't got to these healthier leaves over here yet. But if you look closely, you can see that actually the bark has been stripped off here. And, it, and I think that is generally gonna be true. The squirrel damage is the most similar looking to DED. Um, and so that's why it's really important to take a careful look, walk around, look from different angles, see if you can spot that connection point to see if it's been damaged by a squirrel or if it's snapped off or something like that. And with that, um, I think we can open it up a little bit for some questions.